and tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about mysterious monsters and insidious instructions. I'm your host for the evening, Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Charlotte O'Farrell and Kevin David Anderson are voice talents Creepy Face and Trevor Rhines. Now, get your ticket ready, take your seat in our Theater of the Minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is proudly brought to you by June's Journey. I'm here to tell you something useful to use your noggin for. Sometimes the best scenarios are the hypothetical or pretend ones, and that's why I want to tell you about one of my favorite games. It's a captivating game by our friends at Wooga called June's Journey. It's a murder mystery slash hidden object game set back in the roaring 20s with all that era's charm and aesthetic. I play the part of June Parker, amateur detective, investigating the death of her sister. It's free to download, beautifully designed, and at times I have a hard time putting my phone down. It's that enjoyable. Chat and play with or against other players by joining a detective club. You'll even get the chance to play in a detective league to put your skills to the test. Help June relive some of her fondest memories with the new memoir feature. Piece together her past to complete gorgeous albums and unlock exclusive awards like Island Beautifications. June's journey will unleash your inner P.I. while you explore intricate scenes around the world and collect evidence to solve mysteries. Gameplay is engaging and gratifying. Not to mention, you'll be using your mind quite a bit, too. No mindless screen time here, folks. And what's more is the mysteries are ever-evolving. New cases and scenery are added each week, meaning you'll always have a fresh case to dive into. I love playing during the lulls of my evening. It helps me to have a mini mind training session before I fall asleep. All right, I'll admit it, sometimes I sneak away to play all hours of the day. The thing is, friends, when you're a detective, you're a detective. It's my great mission to investigate while strengthening my own mental abilities, meaning June's journey has become my journey. I hope it will become yours too. So why wait? Put your powers of observation to the test and join the rapidly growing community of over 30 million June's Journey fans. And I urge you to give the first level a try. 
escape to a glamorous, often forgotten era full of danger, elegance, mystery, and romance. Trust me on this one. Find your inner detective. Download June's Journey today. Available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PC through Facebook games. Our first tale of the evening is written by Charlotte O'Farrell and is performed by Creepy Face. In it, we'll meet a pair of siblings sent to visit extended family over the summertime. They decide to research the local legends of their area, but you know what they say about curiosity. And without further ado, I present to you Loch Ness. Every summer of our childhood, my twin brother Edmund and I endured a trip to Scotland. We never wanted to go. My parents sent us up there to visit an aunt and uncle we barely knew, and didn't even see for the rest of the year. They said it was to broaden our horizons and give us something to do. But my parents both worked high-powered jobs in finance. Packing us off to Scotland every summer let them work long hours without the guilt of leaving us home alone. It gave us some financial security, but we were never in any doubt that their jobs came before us. So, at the start of the long summer, we'd say goodbye to our friends from the expensive private school our parents sent us to, the same one they'd attend themselves and their parents before them. Those friends would all be jetting off to sunnier climates with their families. When they asked what we were up to for the next few weeks, we'd shrug and say, same as ever, Scotland, with a sigh. They'd either laugh or nod with pity. It all sounds so ungrateful with hindsight. We never went hungry or wanted anything materially. Scotland is lovely, and I've never seen natural beauty that rivals its landscapes. So we had nothing to complain about. But even though we would never have said anything like it out loud, even to each other, both Edmund and I would have much preferred a few days at home with our parents' undivided attention to anything their paychecks could provide us with. The summer after we turned 16, they didn't even drive us to the station to see us off. They hired a taxi for us, though. Edmund pointed out we only had one more summer of this, and then we were free. They couldn't force us up to Scotland once we left school. He'd been counting down to that moment since we were about 12. As soon as we sat down in our seats on the train, Edmund got out a book to read. I'd always envied his ability to read in cars or trains without getting sick. As I looked over enviously, I saw the title of his book. Witchcraft and Spells for the Modern Age. I couldn't look down for more than a few minutes without wanting to vomit. You'd better hide that before we get up to Scotland, I warned him. Our aunt and uncle were extremely religious. Most days, they'd attended an austere stone chapel in the village over, led by a preacher who spoke much more often about the fires of hell than God's love and forgiveness. They had a fear of anything occult that felt almost superstitious. For them, demons were not an abstract idea or a metaphor. They were a concrete reality and they were always around us, ready to pounce and drag our souls to hell at the first opportunity. To my 16-year-old self, these ideas seemed alien and, frankly, ridiculous. Our school had an Anglican chapel that we were all forced to attend a few times a year, but I spent most of those trying to stay awake. Edmund held up his book proudly, and grinned at me on the train. This is research, he said. The first night we're sneaking out and going to Loch Ness. 
I stared at him for a moment, wondering if I'd missed something crucial. Our aunt and uncle's village wasn't far from the famous Loch Ness, and we'd had a few walks around there when we were little. But what was the link with witchcraft? The Loch Ness monster's got something to do with spells? You want to attract it to the surface with some magic? I asked, bemused. Edmund rolled his eyes. He was only 15 minutes older than me, but liked to emphasize those 15 minutes. I hated when he did that to me. It's nothing to do with the monster, he sighed. The monster's a myth. It's to do with the portal to hell. I burst out laughing. What in the hell was this? Are you kidding me? <laughs> a portal to hell? <laughs> Edmund didn't seem put off by my doubt. He leaned forward, theatrically looking up and down the carriage to see if anyone was listening. Did you ever hear of Alistair Crawley? I hadn't, but not wanting to appear ignorant in front of Edmund, I nodded in a non-committal way. Luckily, he spared my blushes by explaining. He lived at the turn of the century. They called him the most wicked man in the world. He was into the occult, dark magic, summoning demons and everything. He owned a manor house on the banks of Loch Ness called Valeskin House. He leaned in closer and started to whisper. He went up there once to perform a ritual. It wasn't evil in itself. He wanted to summon his own guardian angel, but part of the ritual involved summoning the highest demon in hell to bind them and release their power over him. It took six months to do. He had to abstain, no sex, no alcohol, barely any contact with the outside world. His whole life was dedicated to this ritual for half a damn year. Seems a bit more involved than drawing pentagram on the floor and lighting a few candles, I said, laughing nervously. But here's the thing. He never got to finish the ritual. He summoned the demons, then left before he could try to send them back to hell. I snorted. That's ridiculous. So demons are stalking around Scotland, and no one's noticed? Crowley never closed the portal, and since then there have been disappearances, mysterious deaths, weird lights on the lake in the dead of night. Nobody's been able to explain it, but locals stay away from Beleskin House, even so, many years later. I could feel the hair standing up on the back of my neck, but what Edmund was saying was crazy. Okay, I said, sitting back in my chair and looking out of the window watching the countryside fly by. If what you're saying is true, how come nobody's ever heard of this? You mentioned Loch Ness. People think of Nessie, little survivor dinosaurs or sea serpents swimming about, getting photographed every so often. Not demons. Nessie's just a distraction from what's really going on, Edmund said with the confidence of someone explaining the earth revolved around the sun. I don't know, maybe they hype up the phony monster as a way to distract people from the dark shit going on around there. Most people would take a cuddly monster over a demon any day, and it keeps people watching the water. Not the dilapidated mansion the evilest man in the world lived in. My side, there would be no convincing him. If you want to check it out, I'm in, I said, but not because I believe in demons or any of that. It's just, it just sounds more fun than anything else we'll get into this summer. But tell me this, if we get there and there are no demons, no guardian angels, or no orbs of light in the sky, will you agree to give me five bucks? Edmund nodded and shook on it. I look back now in horror at that moment. If I knew then what I know now, even five million dollars wouldn't have convinced me to go to that place in the dark. My aunt and uncle met us at the station. 
They weren't the type of people to show a lot of physical affection, but my aunt gave us both a quick kiss on the cheek, which was more than our parents gave us most times we saw them. They took us home, asking about school and the sort of religious education we got. We answered politely, stiffly. I told them what they wanted to hear. The little nighttime adventure had started to grow on me, as we ate dinner, with grace beforehand, of course, and sat playing board games in the lounge of the evening. All I could think about was Loch Ness. I still thought Edmund's talk about demons was stupid, but it would make a memorable story to tell our friends at school when we returned after summer. Our aunt and uncle were early to bed, early to rise types, so it was barely 8 o'clock when they started making noises about the lateness of the hour. Edmund and I, feigning yawns, agreed. We laid in our twin beds in the spare room for well over an hour, listening out for any signs of life. We heard them get dressed, chat a little, pray, then turn out the lights. Once an extra few minutes had passed, I heard Edmund gently ease himself out of bed. He'd packed his sneaking out kit close to the top of his suitcase and left the suitcase open. This made it easy to slip the stuff we were taking out without making any unnecessary noise. I checked the bag, a torch, a change of clothes for us both, his magic book, some money, and a knife for protection. We eased our bedroom window open and snuck out into the cold air of the night. The terrain was rugged. Recent rainfall had made the house's surroundings muddy, despite the time of year. We slipped and tripped over rocks so many times we lost count. Edmund insisted on holding the torch and went in front, so I was the one falling face first into the wet grass most of the time. How neither of us ended up with a twisted ankle or knocking ourselves unconscious on that walk into town, I'll never know. Maybe it was fate that we went to Loch Ness that night. Once we were in the center of the tiny town, getting to Loch Ness became easy. We would take the last bus up to it, have our little exploration, then hitchhike home. We were used to hitchhiking. Most times, when we'd sneak out of school with our friends, we'd go hitchhike to some nearby city or go to rock concerts just to get away for a day. Doing it so often had dulled us to the potential dangers. It was pitch black by the time we arrived at the lock. It had started to rain lightly again, but nothing that would put us off. I was buzzing with excitement. Only one old lady got off the bus simultaneously as us. She watched us for a while as we walked from the bus stop to the lock. Be careful out there, she said quietly in her rural Scottish accent. I don't know what you're doing out near this lake, but it's not safe here. There are things on the lock you don't want to know about. It's okay, ma'am. We're not scared of the monster, Edmund replied cheerfully, smiling at her. She didn't return his smile. The monster? Oh, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, the woman replied with a sigh. She turned on her heel and walked away, back towards civilization. As we moved further from the bus stop, the footpaths got less well lit. Soon, we came across the great, famous lock. There was a full moon overhead. I still remember the gentle glow of the ripples on the lake's surface, stretching as far as our eyes could see. The lights from the building surrounding Loch Ness reflected and twinkled on the water. For a few moments, Edmund and I stood, transfixed. Demons, monsters, and warlocks couldn't have seemed further from reality. Well, we're here, I said to Edmund finally. What next? How do we get old Saint Nick down here? Edmund tutted. The term is Old Nick. He replied, matter-of-factly, Old Nick's the devil. Old Saint Nick is Santa Claus, idiot. I was glad of the night time to spare my blushes. Edmund set off across the side of the lock, and I followed along behind, trying not to lose my footing on the grassy verge. I didn't fancy falling into a freezing cold lock in the middle of the night, 
and I didn't know how deep it got. How far along is Beleskin House? I asked eventually. We're gonna need to row to it, Edmund said. What? Row with what? I followed Edmund's gaze and answered my own question. There were four rickety looking rowing boats, big enough for two people, tied along the bank up ahead. We'd both been in our school's rowing team at various points in our time there, so we wouldn't be likely to get tired too easily rowing out onto a lock and back, but I felt uneasy about the idea of stealing one of these boats, and even more so about the prospect of taking to the water in boats that looked like a slight wind could break them. We're just going to steal? Borrow, Edmund corrected. We're going to borrow one. Nobody will ever know, and let's face it, they're not being used. I couldn't argue with the logic. We raced down to the boats. I picked out the most sturdy one, with two solid looking oars for us to use. Edmund threw our supplies in and lowered himself into the boat. I supported his weight easily. He nodded and pointed the torch at my feet so I could see how to jump in. The boat was so small, our knees touched when we sat down in it. I could feel the wooden sides pressing against my thighs at both sides. Every small movement of the water felt like we could be tossed into the lock at any moment. I felt my anxiety melt away as we rowed out onto the water and started to get into the rhythm of the water's movements. And for the first time since we'd snuck out of our aunt and uncle's house, we started to have fun. Edmund brought his oar down especially hard splashing water into my face. Laughing, I returned the favor. Once we were a good way out of the shore, we looked back at dry land. The twinkling lights looked further away than ever now, drowned out by the inky darkness of our peaceful surroundings. <sighs> I don't think you're going to find your demons out here, Edmund. I told him with a theatrical sigh. Smirking, he reached into the backpack. Don't be so sure, he said, producing the book on magic he'd been reading on the train up to Scotland. We haven't started the ritual yet. I sat back on the bottom of the boat. There wasn't much room for me to stretch out, and laughed into the void. I could hear the sound echoing around. Edmund, this is... But he wasn't listening. He'd opened the book to the page he'd bookmarked. He held it open in one hand, balanced on his knees, and held the torch with the other so he could read out the strange incantations. There was my 16-year-old brother, brow furrowed in concentration, reading what sounded like a cartoonish mockery of a Latin text. Deadly serious, he started reading out the words of the spell. He stumbled over his lines a few times. Having felt scared at the beginning of our little adventure, I now found myself struggling not to giggle. What the fuck were we doing out here, trying to summon demons in the middle of Loch Ness, rather than tucked up in bed? It was ridiculous. I started to gently rock the boat and shout out faux Latin phrases of my own, anything that sounded official or spiritual. Our fiercely Protestant aunt and uncle would have been almost as horrified by the approximation of Catholicism as our childish dipping into the occult. Edmund shot me an irritated look, but continued on with his reading. I was still gently rocking the boat when something bumped the side of it with some force. The crash was loud, and we were both thrown to the side. What the hell? I started to say. Another bump. A third impact. This one shattered some of the wood. Luckily for us, the break was above water level. This time, whatever was crashing into us was huge, powerful, and angry. I grabbed my oar. Quickly! I shouted to Edmund. But he wasn't listening. He was perched at the side of the boat, fixated by whatever was hitting us. I'd never seen his face like that before. A mixture of terrified and awestruck. I didn't want to see whatever this fucking animal was that was nearly sinking us. I snatched his oar and started rowing for my life. The boat moved, but it wouldn't go where I wanted it to. 
It kept going in circles on the spot. The harder I rode, the faster it span, like we were caught in a whirlpool. I caught a glance at the thing trying to sink us. This was Nessie, all right, or so I thought. I saw flashes of turquoise scales, a serpentine head as large as a dog. But what really caught my attention were its eyes. Red, slit-like eyes that darted from side to side as it eyed up its meal. She's beautiful, breathed Edmund. I wanted to slap him. Snap out of it and help me row, I screamed. He didn't even look back at me. The demon has come. We called and she came. She came. She's here to do our bidding. We're going to have all the powers of hell at our disposal. His voice didn't even sound like his own anymore. He was spouting gibberish, breathless with excitement. The great beast raised its head above the water and let out a ferocious growl. The sound reverberated through my bones. Just hearing it made my skull feel like it was going to explode. Defeated, I stopped rowing. The spinning of the boat was making me sick. Help us! Help! I started to shout at the top of my lungs. My cries echoed, but if anyone in those lakeside houses heard me, they didn't respond. No one was coming for us. Edmund leaned towards the water. Take me, demon queen, he shouted. Are you fucking mad? I tried to pull him back into the boat. I really did. But the monster moved so quickly. I've played that moment repeatedly in my mind, wondering if there was anything I could have done differently. It rose its eel-like body into the air, splashing water everywhere. Edmund raised a hand as if he expected it to take him away. Instead, Nessie dipped down and ripped his arm off. I heard the sound of flesh tearing and bone shattering. My brother keeled back, nearly falling into the water, spraying blood as he went. The monster roared again and went in for another lightning quick attack. This time it grabbed the skin flap from what used to be Edmund's shoulder. With a sickening, sucking sound, it tore off its skin and devoured it. There was a wet, tearing noise as it was pried away from the rest of his body. The bloody mess that had once been Edmund was instantly reduced to a convulsing pile of tissue, muscle, and bone. My flayed brother turned to me. For a horrific moment, our eyes met, and despite the darkness at that moment, I could tell he was still alive. I could feel the visceral fear emanating from him as his tortured body flailed around in agony. Somehow, I found the presence of mind to grab the oars again. This time, when I started to row, it worked. Adrenaline drove me forward as I rode harder than I ever had before. Edmund's skinned body slumped against my legs. I could feel the blood soaking through my trousers. The creature reared up again, roaring louder than before. The sound went straight through me. Its devilish eyes met mine. It could have lunged forward and torn me to pieces too. For whatever reason, it didn't. It sunk back into the depths and disappeared. My road and road. Eventually, after what felt like hours, I reached the shore. And there stood my aunt and uncle, along with two stern-looking police officers. They took in the scene. My aunt's screams as she saw Edmund's disfigured corpse sounded like they would never end. I don't remember much. I guess I was in shock. But I remember them slapping handcuffs on me. I remember one of the police officers throwing a sheet over what remained of Edmund. And as I was led to the car, 
I remember my uncle's eyes boring into me as if he was looking at Satan himself. May God has mercy on ye, he muttered. No one else will. I don't expect you to believe me. No one does. I'm just the crazy creep who kidnapped his brother and skinned him alive on Loch Ness. Or so the press has said so repeatedly over the past twenty years. But what I say is the truth. I've had a lot of time to think about that night, locked up in here. There's nothing else to do, just padded cell walls to stare at, and the doubting looks of psychiatrists to endure when I tell them that the Loch Ness Monster killed my brother. I've had so many diagnoses over the past years and taken more medication than I'd care to list. You'll never make progress unless you accept the truth, they tell me, over and over again. You killed your brother. You ripped his skin off with a knife and then threw it in the lock. Accept reality. Can I blame them? In their shoes, I'd probably think I was crazy. But in my long years of isolation, I've built a theory about what killed Edmund on that lake. Nessie, sure. But that was no dinosaur. It wasn't some weird fish that had found its way further inland than it should have. The creature was a demon. I'm convinced when Edmund spoke whatever magic it was, it did indeed call back the hellish creatures Crowley summoned. I don't think it's any coincidence that this lock, of all of them, is the one known worldwide for both monsters and devil worship. There's got to be a link. And I think I stared that link in the damn eyes. People think they see a monster. They rationalize it as a biological thing. A throwback to prehistoric times. But take it from me. That thing is from hell. I can see you don't believe me. So be it. You're one of many. But trust me when I say this. Never go to Loch Ness at night. I hope you enjoyed Loch Ness as written by Charlotte O'Farrell and voiced by Creepy Face. Charlotte O'Farrell is a horror writer, a lifelong fan of the genre. She writes about all manner of the weird and wonderful. Her stories have appeared in anthologies and podcasts. She also writes daily flash fiction on Twitter at CHA O'Farrell as well as Facebook. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. 19th century novelist Henry David Thoreau is known for the quote, not until we are lost do we begin to understand ourselves. Now I'm not sure what the hell that means, but I'm gonna try to help him out here. See, with all the stress, anxiety, and aggravation we face on a daily basis, it's all too easy to feel lost. I mean, who can absorb all the punishment of daily life without losing your footing once in a while? Which brings me to another quote of Thoreau's, and I think this one makes much more sense. Quote, it takes two to speak the truth, one to speak, and another to hear. Unquote. So now that we're all lost and have thusly found ourselves, we understand the thesis of Thoreau's entire body of work, which is simply this. Whatever your issues, you should be talking out your problems with a licensed professional therapist from BetterHelp. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that will not only help you better understand yourself, but will provide you with a listener you always needed. Whatever issues you're going through, BetterHelp has that all-important second-party throw so strongly stressed. Add to that, it's a licensed professional listener who's certified to help you. It's super fast and easy to get started. Forget the weeks long wait to pencil in an appointment. With BetterHelp, you can be matched with a the perfect therapist within 48 hours. From then on, you're a team. 
You can text anytime and get timely responses and advice. You can schedule weekly phone or video calls, whichever you're more comfortable with. And speaking of comfortable, it's all done from your phone or computer, so there's no need for waiting rooms or awkward in-person visits. You can do it all from the comfort of your own home. Having a dedicated listener has been such a great help for me. The longer you go without talking out your problems, it seems like they only get worse. If you've been wallowing in despair, I can't stress it enough. Sitting idle is the last thing you want to do. But with a good listener never further than arms reach away, you'll know why millions of people have used BetterHelp to help get their lives back on track. And it's affordable. With BetterHelp, the overhead of traditional therapy is gone, and those savings get passed on to you. There's even financial aid available if you need it. In short, you get all the positives of professional therapy and none of the negatives. It's time-proven treatment with a modern-day delivery system. Hey, don't get me wrong. I also appreciate you guys listening to me too. It's just, it's kind of a one-way street here. Let's do it the Rose way. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash chilling today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash chilling. Our second tale of the evening comes to us from author Kevin David Anderson and is performed by Trevor Rines. So you have captured a fairy, properly smothered it in a jar laced with alcohol, and are now wondering what to do next. Stay tuned to find out. Now, without further ado, I present to you Mounting Fairies for Display. The following article first appeared in Decorating with Nature magazine, August 2019. Mounting Fairies for Display, a step-by-step how-to guide. Fun for the whole family. By Dr. Morgan Z. Vile. So, you have captured a fairy, properly smothered it in a jar laced with alcohol, and are now wondering what to do next. Why not share that trophy with friends and loved ones by preserving your prize in a beautiful display case or frame? Mounting fairies can be an exhilarating activity for the whole family, producing highly sought-after decorative centerpieces. Decorating guru Philip Yen says, Mounted fairies are the perfect accessory to any eclectic or feng shui decor. But even Joe Sixpack can enjoy a fine display of mounted fairies because preparing their bodies for viewing is a hobby that the entire family can enjoy. My sons and I have been hunting and mounting tiny folk for almost 20 years. It's a pastime that has helped us bond in ways I haven't been able to describe completely in over a dozen how-to books available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and wherever fine books are sold. Now, what you will need to gather before unscrewing that jar are the following. An assortment of stick pins, tweezers, rubber gloves, a mounting board, the best kind are fashioned from balsa wood or styrofoam, several pieces of paper, earplugs, weights or clamps, and embalming aerosol. Aerosol not legal in California, but available in a pump spray. All these items can be acquired at your local hobby store. Step 1. Before unscrewing that lid, make sure you place your earplugs firmly in your ears. Fairies emit a series of high-pitched screams while in their death throes, which dissipate but more times than not are still held captive within the jar. Direct exposure to these high tones of anguish can cause erectile dysfunction, evacuation of the bowels, and promote allergies. If you have a dog, you may wish to put him outside. Step 2. Open the jar. After waiting at least five minutes for the death screams to dissipate, reach in with fingers or tweezers and retrieve your fairy carcass. Lay your prize face down in the beveled out section of your mounting board. This bevel should be three quarters of an inch wide and half an inch deep. 
it is important to get to this step within 12 hours of death. You are in a race against rigor mortis. Any delay in mounting and preserving your ferry can end with dissatisfying and unsightly results. Step 3. Select your mounting pin and place the tip between the specimen's shoulder blades. Press gently but firmly, piercing the back and chest cavity and emerging through the sternum. Then, with caring hands, lift upwards on the wings until the impaled body slides up on the pin, becoming level with the mounting board's main surface. Then, and only then, can you remove your earplugs. Residual screams often linger in the lungs and are released when the pin punctures the chest. I went through more than one pair of pants before I learned that lesson. Step 4. With a steady hand, spread the wings flat on the board. Upon touching a fairy's wing, you will discover fine dust will come off on your fingertips. This dust comes from row upon row of tiny scales that cover the wing's delicate surface. It is these scales that make the lovely designs of color and light, but it is these same scales and excreting dust that gives the North American skunk fairy its paralyzing odor. Even in death, this noxious creature can have toxic effects. Proper breathing protection can mean the difference between a festive fairy mounting experience or a trip to the emergency room with all your limbs going numb. But let's assume we are dealing with a simple, common variety fairy, such as the Bayou Betty or the New England Hockaloogie. Continue by laying pieces of paper over the wings, using pins to secure the paper to the board. Take care not to pierce these wings. They are as fragile as tissue paper and can rupture at the slightest provocation. Step 5. Take your weights or clamps and secure the board to your desk or work table. Fairies are clever creatures and often find ways to mimic death, even during the piercing. They just wait until you step from the room, then try to flee, taking the mounting board with them. I once stepped out to answer the phone before securing the board and returned to find it spinning in the air like a barn shingle caught in a dust devil. Before I got it under control, I had a busted lamp, a cracked computer monitor, and a very perplexed cat. Step 6. Let rigor mortis do its thing. That's right. You're done for the next 10 to 12 hours. You can spend this time stalking more fairies or curling up with one of my many how-to books published by the good people at Triple Serpent Press. Step 7. We're almost home now. After a minimum of 10 hours, release the pins holding the paper and you will notice that the wings are permanently spread out, displaying their wealth of beauty. You can now remove the fairy from the board, holding it by the head of the pin used to impale the chest. If you flip the fairy over and re-examine its face, you will notice that the expression frozen on its tiny features during suffocation is not a pleasant one. Displaying them in this state will be perfect for Halloween, but unseemly the rest of the year. To remedy this, it's time for a bit of what I call molding. Take your tweezers or stick pin and gently nudge the corners of the fairy's mouth. Change that painful, anguished scream into a delightful, sprightly smile. At this stage, the fairy skin molds very much like clay, and you can sculpt a variety of expressions. Experiment! Have fun with it. Step 8. Put on your rubber gloves, take your embalming aerosol or pump spray, and generously apply the preserving enamel. I like to give it two coats of the high gloss variety with UV protection. This will keep your fairies from fading, chipping, peeling, or reanimating. Now your prize is ready for framing. You can now hang it up on the wall and Pat yourself on the back for a job well done. That's all for now, my fellow fairy hunters. And remember, the only good fairy is a mounted fairy. Happy hunting! Footnote, author's bio. Dr. Morgan Z. Vile killed his first fairy at the tender age of eight when he discovered a twin-headed Mortimer tormenting his pet hamster.
After dispatching the fairy with natural expert abilities, his parents encouraged his interest in fairy hunting, pixie skinning, and pest control. Vile attended the university at Berkeley, where he earned degrees in xenobiology, cryptozoology, and accounting. With a doctorate from Darkmyth in miniature humanoid anatomy, he is currently the department chair for Other World Studies at the University of Bradbury. An author of more than a dozen how-to books, he is probably best known as a founding member of the FHA, Fairy Hunters of America, acting as this powerful lobbying organization's president from 1992 to 2001. He was forced out of office during an FBI sting for suspected violation of the Lewd Conduct with Humanoids Act of 1967. Weil received a full pardon from outgoing President Bill Clinton. His author credits include Mounting Fairies for Fun and Profit, Laparoscopic Taxidermy Stuffing Miniature Humanoids, Fairies, The Other White Meat, and the New York Times bestselling book Casting Fairies in Metal, a step-by-step -step guide to creating necklaces and charms out of fairies, pixies, and other tiny folk. Excerpt from eBay Action number 345-678-870, listed on October 31st of this year. Product Description A true must-have for any collector of surface world trophies. The most wanted human in all the seven realms, Dr. Morgan Z. Vile elegantly mounted and displayed. The frame has been handcrafted from cavern driftroot by wood elves, and the mounting was executed by realm-renowned human taxidermist and gnome William Zigarden. Notice how the cause of death has been beautifully concealed by Zigarden, who worked around the clock to stitch up over 7,000 tiny bites and stab wounds. This display stands over two meters tall and will brighten up any forest, gully, or subterranean rumpus room. The winner pays shipping and handling and must contact the seller within three Center Earth days at the close of auction. Payment accepted in money order, grub nuts, or PayPal. No personal checks. If you have any questions regarding this or any of our other mounted humans or stuffed felines up for bid, please email us at vengeful-wings at gnomemail.com. I hope you enjoyed Mounting Fairies for Display, as written by Kevin David Anderson and performed by Trevor Rhines. Trevor Rhines, quote, sounds like a dragon, like a landslide, like a force of nature, unquote, according to one evil idol fan. A Toronto-based voice actor since 2005, his low rumbling voice has been heard on TV, radio, film, documentaries, audio dramas, podcasts, old-time radio play reenactments, and narrating on stage with orchestras. In under a year, he performed in all of Shakespeare's plays. He's also a board game designer who's quoted on DNA in the Dictionary of Canadian Quotations. Now, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you could find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is proudly brought to you by Best Fiends. I'm not the only member of the Chilling Tales team to be enchanted by the fiends in all of their slugmageddon glory. Our COO Natalie Brown also loves to shed a little slug. 
She just updated me on her level. She's doing all right so far, but at level 263, that's right, I played a quick round between ad breaks, I'm still way ahead. <laughs> a little competition doesn't have to be a bad thing, folks. Best Fiends is a free-to-download mobile puzzle game with thousands of exciting levels for new adventures and challenges every time you play. There are dozens of unique fiends to collect, so you can customize your team of fiends to defeat menacing slugs. Power up your favorite fiends to new levels for even more powerful skills and watch them transform as they get stronger. As I mentioned earlier, with offline play, you'll never be stranded without fun even if you lose your internet connection. What's more is, brand new events and challenges pop up all year round, so you've always got a chance to earn exclusive in-game items, characters, and rewards. The newly released Season of Harvest still has 22 days left if you want to join. These events can help you earn perks, special characters, as well as energy and keys to open crates. I love all the incentives there are to play. I have so much fun climbing up the ranks and seeing the evolution of difficulties. And usually with new difficulties come new attack methods. Download Best Fiends for free from the App Store or Google Play. You'll even get $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Thank you for your support, fellow fiends, and for supporting the sponsors that make this show possible. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.